So with that, I want to hand, this, hand it over to our keynote speaker, Steve O'Grady. He's a uh, co-founder of Red Month. Um, he's going to talk about the power of convenience. Live on the mic while I get hooked up here. Okay. So, as was said, let's see if this works. Um, I'm going to talk to you about something that's a little different this morning. Assuming that this actually fires up. Okay. Wonderful. So, we do here. What does that show? Okay, that's interesting. It's not the presentation. Okay, all right. All right, here we go. Okay, so we're back. So as I said, uh, I'm going to talk to you about something a little different this morning. Uh, this is. A, a, a little bit of a different version of a talk I gave at a conference that we run uh, about, what is it, about a month or two ago. Um, for, first of all, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Stephen O'Grady, I'm the co-founder of Redmonk. Uh, for those of you who don't know Redmonk, Redmonk is what we call a developer-focused industry analyst firm. Uh, but particularly for this audience, uh, for this event, uh, it's important to say that when we use the term developer, we're using that term pretty loosely. You know, essentially what we're describing and what we what we research, what we focus on are practitioners, right? So that might be somebody who's a front-end developer, back-end developer, could be a DBA, could be a sysadmin. In some cases, it could be a designer, right? Ultimately, what we at Redmonk are focused on are the people out in the trenches building technology, building applications, building the infrastructure that powers, well, most of the world today. And, you know, this is a conversation that we are having over and over and over with people in open source communities, people using open source products, you know, people taking these things, or taking all the technologies that are available and building interesting things with them. And, you know, really, it, it is, it's about convenience. Now, when I gave this talk originally, I put this, this particular image up on Twitter ahead of the event. And I asked everybody, you know, what the, you know, sort of thinking was, you know, why would I include this, you know, when we talk about convenience? I got a number of guesses. My favorite guess was that this was uh, a, an ice cube for a giant old fashioned, um, which it's not. The reason I include this is that this is essentially how we used to do refrigeration. Now, I promise you're probably sitting there thinking, I don't understand what the hell this has to do with databases, but I promise we'll get there. So this ultimately is how everybody used to cool all of their perishable goods. You know, it's impossible to remember now because most of us, I'm assuming probably all of us, uh, have refrigeration uh, technologies in our houses. But effectively what you used to do is you used to carve this up, uh, carve up a block of ice, drop it in an ice box, which is, I'm assuming, why my parents call the refrigerator the ice box. And that's how you essentially kept things cool, you know, this giant block of ice. And again, it's, it's sort of startling to sort of think about, you know, this is not that far away from where we are today. And, you know, where I am, I come from Portland, Maine, uh, a couple peninsulas up from us, they used to actually cut giant blocks out of the ice from the Kennebec River, dump them on these ships, pack the ships with sawdust, and actually sail this ice to India. Now, I can't get my mind around the economics of how that would ever make sense, let alone the physics of the fact that ice makes it from Maine to India. But again, this is how things were done. Now, <clears throat> if we fast forward a little bit, um, this is the Southland Ice Company. So the Southland Ice Company uh, was, as you might expect, a outfit that sold the blocks of ice that we just saw. So in other words, they had these docks, you drive up to a dock, you get a giant block of ice, you take it home. And you'd put it in your ice box, and again, that was effectively your refrigerator. And you know, they had 16 locations, they operated out of Dallas, and you know, this is just what they did for years. Years and years and years, hey, we sell ice, and you know, this is essentially our business. Now, most of us in business, you know, we are oriented towards what we do, 
right? So the South and Ice Company focused on this and said, hey, we make ice, right? This is our business. This is the business that we're in, and everything that we do goes into making ice. Now, around uh, 1927, uh, an individual who worked for this company, who is uh, known affectionately, I assume, as Uncle Johnny, um, had the idea that you know, people were coming into the um, ice shop and maybe they wanted to pick something else up you know, while they were there. Maybe they wanted something besides just this giant block of ice. So he made the decision to begin selling you know, a couple of other perishable goods, nothing super fancy, uh, eggs, milk, uh, bread, so when you came in you know, for uh, these items, you could purchase them in one place. This was effectively the beginning of what we now know today as a convenience store. And the South and Ice Company um, became a brand that uh, many of us in the US know as 7-Eleven. So not too long after uh, they started selling you know, some of these perishable goods, they also looked at it and said, hey, you know what, you know, people are coming into our stores and asking for gas. So why don't we sell them that? 1928, they began selling gas. Um, you know, why did they go to uh, 24 hours a day? If you know the 7-Eleven brand, part of you know, what you know about that brand very likely uh, is the fact that they are open seven days a week, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Now, they started this in 1963. Uh, they started this in 1963, at a location near the University of Texas uh, because, as it turned out, there was a football game the University of Texas played, and a whole bunch of people came in the stores, which at that time were only open until 11 o'clock at night, and effectively refused to leave. And the sales, you know, when people stayed very, very late, were enough that the, the business turned around and said, hey, you know what, there's actually something here. And that business went to 24 hours a day. All the rest eventually followed suit. So, you know, the question that you're probably asking with all of this is what, what does any of this have to do with technology, all right? And I think it's an important point because we think about, again, you know, whatever your business is here, you know, whatever your association, whatever your role is with Postgres, you are in a particular business. Uh, very frequently, you are focused on that business. And, you know, one of the things that gets lost is what's convenient. Why are people, you know, sort of doing so certain things? Why are they buying certain things? And the South and Ice Company, which became 7-Eleven, had a couple of core realizations, which was, hey, you know what? It's more convenient for people to pick some of these you know, basic goods up from us than it might be to go to a grocery store. You know, maybe we should you know, extend our hours you know, to accommodate that. Maybe we should sell other things that they naturally want at the same time, like gas. So again, what does this have to do with technology? More specifically, what does this have to do with Postgres? You know, which is what we're all here to talk about. This is a, an, an analogy, it's a conversation that I've recounted many, many times over the years. But you know, way back in 2005, 2006 timeframe, I had a conversation with a number of people in the uh, Postgres community, and the topic was MySQL. And a number of people in the, in the Postgres community wanted to know specifically why MySQL was growing so quickly. You know, they felt objectively that Postgres is a better database, it's more scalable, had better features, more performant, take your pick. Now, we can argue the merits of those claims, but that was the feeling. And I asked them a simple question at the time. I said, okay, well, how do you get Postgres? And they said, I, you know, first, I, I don't understand, what do you mean? How do I get Postgres? I said, just that. If I'm new to the project, if I want to download it, where do I start? And they said, oh, it's not a big deal. You go to the Postgres website, you know, we have different builds for different distributions. Obviously, if you want the source, you can get that as well. But you know, really, if you just want a database um, and you, know, you just want to get up and running with it as quickly as possible, easy to do. I said, okay, that's great. Um, how do you get MySQL? And they said, well, it's different because it's in the Linux repository, so it's just sudo apt get install MySQL. And that, to me, was a hugely, hugely important point and it's a point that, you know, this is not to single out the Postgres community, it's a conversation that we've had over and over and over with, uh, you know, essentially lots and lots of different open source projects over the years, which is that the open source project tends to focus just on the technology. They tend to focus just on the project. They tend to focus on the merits of that technology, and that's it. And my point is, you know, very much like we saw with the South and Ice Company, you need to think about factors that maybe you're not considering. 
right? You need to think about the power of convenience and the importance of convenience in that brand. Because as it played out in the technology industry, many, many people were picking a database that the Postgres community felt, you know, the Postgres community at least felt was technically inferior, and they were picking it not because of a, an evaluation of the technical merits, but because they can install it from a single command on the command line. And again, this is anathema. You know, this is a horrifying, horrifying realization to so many in the open source world because, you know, we have been brought up in many cases to feel that the technology industry, this remarkable meritocracy where only the best technologies survive and get used, and all decisions are made purely on the merits of the technology itself. And the unfortunate fact is, is that having done this for a very long time, um, I can tell you that not only does the best technical product not win in every case, it doesn't win in most cases. And this is something that, you know, this power of convenience is something that we all know, right, on some level. This is not some sort of, you know, unique realization. Right? Think about it, how it plays out in daily life. Does anybody, actually, does anybody know Sam Goody? I'm probably dating myself from using this reference. Okay, so a couple of people at least. So for the younger people in the audience who don't know what Sam Goody is, there was a time when you couldn't just download a track, right? If you wanted to, the equivalent of downloading a track was you had to drive to a store and buy a whole record. Probably most of the other tracks were terrible, but that was your only option, right? And that option was sustained for years and years and years and decades and decades and decades because there was no more convenient alternative. Now, along comes this service called Napster. Napster, not that I ever used it, but from what I heard, <laughs> was much more convenient to use, much more convenient to get, and as a result, absolutely blew up and became this unique phenomenon. And while Napster itself did not survive, Napster gave us essentially the world that we have today, which is a more convenient world because ultimately it forced the companies that were you know, adhering to this Sam Goody model to essentially give in, right? To eventually, you know, a number of steps, a number of years to get there, but eventually get to the point where they would sell you DRM-less tracks that you could download individually. And again, this power of convenience is a, is a um, market driver that we have all, in most cases, experienced. If it's not music, maybe it's programming languages, right? If you're gonna write something and you want it to be fast, you know, the odds are pretty good you're gonna write it in C. C, C++, and there's a number of different choices we can make. But in other words, people don't choose PHP for that reason. And yet it powers, you know, depending on whose metrics you believe, something close to a third of the world's websites. Why is that? It's more convenient. It's easier to pick up, it's easier to use, it's easier to run with, and some would argue it's easier to make mistakes. But the point here is, is that, you know, we have seen this play out in the programming language community again, over and over and over again, where the languages that are really taking off are increasingly abstract, you know, from the underlying metal. They are therefore, you know, more convenient to use. The open source community has, you know, understood convenience all along. Right, when we think about sort of, you know, the classic battle between Linux and Windows, you know, a lot of that uh, convenience, a lot of that advantage that open source enjoyed was the fact that you could get it, right? And that, you know, particularly in the early days when you know, I was tinkering around with Linux and trying to build kernels, it was a pain. Right? It was very, very difficult to work with at the time, particularly relative to Windows, which, you know, you fire it up, you know, boots, it's got a nice GUI, you can sort of walk through. And yeah, maybe there's some things I don't like about it. But, you know, at the time, the, certainly the out-of-the-box experience was superior. But the convenience of open source, in this case, you know, took it to where it is today. You know, we're effectively on the cloud, it's the default operating system. Now, we're even seeing this play out within the open source community itself. Um, this is probably a little bit of an eye chart for you. Uh, if you Google Redmonk open source licensing, you'll probably turn up the report that has these. You can read about it in more detail. But the point here, ultimately, is, is that at Redmonk, we have tracked, you know, as I said before, we look at practitioner data, right? So one of the things that we're interested in is the actual people writing source code, what licenses are they choosing? So ultimately what this chart is depicting is, is that if you look over a seven year period, you know, from 2010 to 2017, what you end up finding is that the trend overall is towards permissive licensing. So it used to be, you know, uh, back in 2010, the GPL accounted for somewhere close to two-thirds of all licenses. You know, layer on top of that, some of the more um, 
you know, some of the other you know, sort of reciprocal style or uh, copyleft style licenses, and you're talking about a huge chunk of uh, open source code. What we've seen since is that uh, the MIT license in particular, and the Apache to a slightly lesser extent, uh, you know, have effectively tripled or doubled uh, in terms of their share. Now, still tons of reciprocally licensed assets out there, so it's not like the GPL is going away, in case there are GPL advocates in the audience who are gonna um, get all up in arms about this. But the simple fact is, is that if you look at the trend line over time, what we're seeing is a trend line towards permissive. Now, what does that say? You know, why, is, you know, why am I bringing that up now? One of the things that we hear from open source developers in terms of why they're selecting these licenses is that they're simply more convenient. If I attach the MIT license you know, to a project, you know, my responsibilities with respect to that code and re with respect to um, you know, essentially you know, trying to manage that project and trying to manage my responsibilities around that, that source code over time are minimal. You know, contrast that versus the GPL and certainly the AGPL, I have a much stronger set of responsibilities. Now, we can argue, and many have, you know, philosophically about which is better for open source and you know, sort of what's the appropriate license. Um, I don't have a personal stake in that. But what I can tell you is, is that all of the data that we look at, this, this data comes from Black Duck, there are other sources that basically say the same thing, is, is that this is a style of license that is increasingly popular, and it's increasingly popular in our opinion because it's more convenient for developers. Now that's the good news. The bad news is that the even more convenient thing is to not license your project at all. Now, you know, many point out, so this is GitHub's numbers, um, and you see basically it's somewhere around 20% of projects are carrying a license. Now, many people point out that, uh, and I've done this myself, that a lot of the source code on GitHub are just throwaway things, that people are you know, posting up there for their own reference so they can find it later. It's nothing that actually needs you know, a, a license attached to it because they don't necessarily intend for it to be used you know, sort of as a popular project. But the fact is, is that you know, at the scale that you, you know, see with GitHub, there are a lot of projects out there that should have licenses that don't. And they don't have licenses because the most convenient thing for developers is to not pick anything at all. So, you know, lest you sort of walk away from this presentation thinking that convenience is, you know, just a sort of universal good, it's not. You know, it definitely comes with some costs. But again, think about how this has played out, you know, from, you know, different markets over time, right? Siebel, you know, years and years and years ago, you know, when I was a systems integrator, we were running around, Siebel was a dominant force in the customer relationship management software market. And, all of a sudden, you know, you have this upstart, you know, which in the course of, you know, a very, very brief span of time, relatively speaking, you know, blew up and, you know, sort of IPO'd and became the business that we know today as Salesforce. And how do they do that? Well, it's a much more convenient argument. If you're, you know, installing on-prem CRM software, you have to have all sorts of conversations about hardware platforms, operating systems, implementation. Oh, and by the way, half the implementations fail. If you go in and you have a conversation for Salesforce, it's do you have a browser, right? And obviously this is not unique to Salesforce. You know, this is essentially the argument of every software as a service company on the planet. But the point here I think is pretty clear, which is that the convenient applications over time are the ones that you know, tend to um, carry the day. Same thing with hardware. Uh, do we have anybody from Dell in the room? Okay, that's good. Um, <laughs> Dell. Uh, you know, and Dell, to its credit, you know, is trying to essentially adapt to a very new environment. But Dell was, you know, effectively um, had its legs taken out from under it, you know, by the Amazon Web Services business, because as efficient, you know, as Dell's supply chain was, and it was justifiably regarded as one of the best in the world at just-in-time assembly and assembling um, uh, pieces of hardware really quickly and shipping it, the best you could hope for. The best, absolute best you could hope for is drop ship, you know, make it there in a day or two, then you have to racket stack and find a network, you know, image the, the hardware, et cetera, right? So best case, you're talking about days. You know, Amazon Web Services comes along and says, well, hey, that's interesting, how about 90 seconds, All right? Now, certainly in the early days, and um, I know there's some folks from uh, Amazon Web Services here, and I'm sure they would acknowledge this as well, in the early days of the service, it was a pain in the ass. And I remember firing up one of the EC2 instances shortly after it launched, and just trying to wire DNS to it was a chore. So it's not as if this technology did not come with drawbacks, and in a vacuum, if you have a very powerful physical server and a sort of a relatively equally powered uh, virtual one, you know, the physical server is probably gonna carry the day because it's you know, more reliable and so on. You're probably gonna get more consistent performance and so on, but it doesn't matter because it's less convenient. And that convenience is huge. 
you know, in terms of, you know, sort of understanding why things get used and how they get used, and the relative trajectories of the physical hardware businesses and the cloud businesses that have come along after them, I think speak to this power. So again, one of the, one of the conversations we have with open source projects over all the time is that you know, convenience is something of a spectrum. Right? It's sort of where you sit. As we talked about in the case of Linux and Windows, you know, one of the principal, and in my opinion, and this is certainly my opinion alone, uh, primary advantages that open source enjoyed over proprietary competition was, was just that, that it was more convenient. You know, you could have, in many cases, a technically inferior product, but it was easier to get, so I'm going to use it. You know, as we, you know, sort of talked about in the case of MySQL. So, you know, if we're looking at this convenience spectrum, you know, why does something like Postgres, in many cases, you know, certainly in the early days, get used, you know, versus Oracle? Well, more convenient to get. But here's the thing, you know, is, is that, you know, for, you know, a lot of open source communities have not adapted to the reality that there's now something more convenient than that. Because what's more convenient than sort of downloading, installing, you know, keeping up uh, Postgres? Not doing any of that at all, right? You know, having you know, effectively somebody do that for you. And you know, that's why if you talk to the folks from Amazon, as I'm um, sure the speaker after me will, will uh, address, the two fastest growing products in the history of that service you know, consecutively have been Redshift and subsequently Aurora. There's a reason for that. They're convenient. They're easy to get. Now, think about this, you know, so I, I gave a talk, uh, I don't know that it was the most popular talk, I don't know that the uh, community enjoyed hearing it, but I think it's important. I gave a talk to the uh, folks from the Apache Software Foundation last year. Now, the Apache Software Foundation, uh, most of you I'm sure are familiar with it, if you're not, uh, it's essentially Big Tent, has lots and lots of different projects. Uh, they have a, a pronounced ethos, a, a governance process that has been proven over time, and they are, are an incredible wealth of software. It's you know, kind of shocking to think about now, but if you go back to the days prior to open source, you know, the, the assets that the Apache Software Foundation has would be you know, worth billions and billions of dollars. You know, that's how good some of this software is, that's how widely it's used, and certainly that's reflected in some of the people who have commercialized it um, and been quite successful in doing so. So you know, from a strict wealth standpoint, or value standpoint, I should say, uh, the Apache Software Foundation is a remarkable achievement. But think about this again from the user perspective in terms of convenience. If I want to assemble an infrastructure that uses some of these projects, okay, great. Um, I now have to figure out, okay, which sort of Apache project does what I want. Um, what are the sort of competitive projects I might want to look at? Maybe I have to sort of bake those off. Uh, then I have to sort of bring them back integrate them, you know, find some way to wire all this together, find some place to stand it up, find some place to run it, uh, and then hopefully find some, somebody who's going to at least stand behind the individual components because it's unlikely I'm gonna find somebody who's gonna essentially commercially back all of the individual pieces I require. That's kind of a chore, right? I mean, that's not the, the simplest argument um, in the world to make, you know, from a sales standpoint. Now, think about option B. What if I just had everything in one pane of glass? And, you know, hey, I don't really have that many choices to make. I don't have to stand everything up myself. I don't have to protect it myself. So, you know, this is not an advertorial for uh, Amazon Web Services. It is rather an encouragement to all of you, if you are in the Postgres community, uh, if you are using Postgres for your own business, to really think about uh, a basic question which is how much time do you spend thinking about convenience? Because again, this is something that we all know, we all understand, this is not a difficult argument to make. You know, when I go out and have talks with our clients or when I give talks at events like this, you can walk through A, B, C, D, E, and you know, the linear progression is pretty clear. You can talk to people on paper and say, do you think this is important? Do you understand why this is important? And everybody nods and says yes. And then when you sit back and you ask them, Okay, so how many meetings have you had about your product, your service, your project that are just and explicitly and exclusively about convenience? And the answer is always zero. So the question I would leave you with then, all of you, is just this. You know, how much time do you think uh, about, you know, how much time do you spend thinking about convenience and how can you spend more uh, moving forward? And with that, I'm done and out of time.
Thank you so much. Appreciate the time.